All right. How do you like the way I injected myself into that video? Well, that was pretty cool. Anyway, uh, while they're figuring out how to get the right background behind me, there it is. Oh, all right, I've been a sunny day. All right, okay. See how easy it is on TV? Okay, I can be in Wisconsin if I want to. Well, anyway, the point is, we're starting the show here, and we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Pollution, all kinds. We're going to talk about nuclear pollution. But first, on a personal level, how about pollution from cigarettes and i'm not talking about the oh i don't like that smoke oh 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 i'm not talking about that type of thing i'm talking about dying I'm talking about death i'm talking about taking 10 years of slow agonizing death to die to well, it wasn't the phrase right but anyway you know what this is raleigh coupons raleigh coupons go ahead and show them the, the, I was, I'm, I'm having to move, and I've been going through all kinds of stuff, boxes from my parents. Raleigh coupons. These, these big ones here, each one of these is from a carton. And these little ones, each one is from a pack of cigarettes. You're supposed to be able to send these in and get some sort of merchandise in exchange, but all my folks got was emphysema. And I spent 10 years waiting on them, changing their oxygen bottles, taking them to the hospital, reaching the stuff on the top shelf, you know, the things that they couldn't do anymore. Not because they were old, but because they couldn't even breathe. They had combined, between the two parents, they had one quarter of a lung. So I want to cash these suckers in for some big prize. I mean, I lost my parents because of this. I want to get, I want, I want my gift from Raleigh Coupon. Well, it, it says on the back here that I can uh, send for a new free catalog to Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corp, Box 903, Louisville, Kentucky, 40201. Or I can call toll-free. I might just do that. Call toll-free 1-800-826-5510. We'll see if that works sometime soon. But I've got enough coupons to get myself a 55-foot yacht. And anyway, what gets me is how do these other folks get to sue for loss of their parents due to smoking? But all I got out of it was these Raleigh coupons. Okay, well, we've got another problem that, that you know, that much more widespread. If you are smoking cigarettes, you're just plain stupid. Absolutely, incredibly stupid. And don't blame it on the fact that it's the most addictive substance known to man. You can still stop. And I tell you right now, the odds are two out of three that you will die a slow, agonizing death because you smoke cigarettes. Two out of three. And I think it's even higher than that because my parents were two out of two. Okay, so anyway. But we're doing it to the world with nuclear waste. And just think how horrible it is. You know, somebody in the elite decided, what do we do with this nuclear waste from our money-making nuclear programs? We can't stop doing it. So we've got to figure out something to do with it. What do we do with it? We can't bury it anywhere because wherever we put it, it's not in my backyard. So what do we do with it? Oh, wow, a genius got a brilliant idea. Not only could he get rid of that nuclear waste, but he could make big money on it because you combine that nuclear waste with the military, indust military industrial complex, depleted uranium. You call it depleted uranium instead of nuclear waste. Depleted means it's not radioactive anymore, doesn't it? No. It means that it's not radioactive enough to generate power efficiently and economically. But it's still deadly and any place that the United States has fired its depleted uranium rounds, which is virtually everywhere, will remain toxic for thousands and thousands of years. And we're already having tremendous birth defects wherever we've done it, like Iraq, Afghanistan. I mean, that is the height of immorality. Do you understand that? 
It's poisoning the world for generations to come. It's like the insane opposite of what the Native Americans had, you know, consider seven generations to the future before you do anything. Well, yeah, here we consider how much money can we make before we get caught. Well, the first one we're going to play is the Real News Network, and we're going to talk about nuclear waste. We'll be back in about eight minutes. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Barrels of nuclear waste at this isolation plant in New Mexico could be a ticking time bomb. Waste from our nuclear weapons has been piling up for about 75 years now. Our next guest, Paul Di Rienzo, has written an investigative report on what he calls failed disposal of the waste from three quarters of a century of weapons development. Joining us now from New York is Paul Di Rienzo. Paul is a freelance journalist and a regular contributor to the Villager newspaper and who, what, why.org, and also Pacifica Radio. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So, Paul, uh, give us a sense of the facility in New Mexico and the explosion that had happened and actually what Kitty Litter had to do with it all. Well, the waste isolation pilot plant is the final disposal location for defense-related nuclear waste that was produced by the United States beginning with the Manhattan Project in 1942. The idea was to bury this waste, some of which which has to be kept isolated from humanity for at least a quarter of a million years, 2,000 feet underground in the New Mexico desert near Carlsbad, New Mexico, south of the capital of New Mexico. And the uh, what happened was that about a year ago, in 2014, the um, a barrel of waste that's stored in barrels exploded. And it was what the uh, Secretary of the Department of Energy, Moniz, Mr. Moniz, called a thermal event. In other words, it heated up to over 1,600 degrees, and radiation monitors started going off, and it was discovered that plutonium, which is a deadly carcinogen, had escaped in small amounts, but detectable amounts, um, for many, many miles around the plant. And considering that this plant was uh, supposed to remain uh, isolated from humanity, as it says, waste isolation pilot plant for 250,000 years, uh, and it's only about a dozen years since the plant was first opened, um, that we're already leaking radiation into the environment. So we have a serious problem here that might cost about $500 million to fix, and which then was later discovered to, uh, unlike what the original uh, description of the incident um, that one barrel of waste was involved. In fact, um, maybe as many as 500 barrels of waste were involved. Paul, tell us uh, about uh, where this waste is coming from and what uh, are other installations across the country that might be housing this type of waste? The waste in particular that we're talking about came from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Los Alamos is the flagship of the American Nuclear Weapons Complex, which is the system of laboratories and factories and other facilities that create the nuclear weapons that make up the United States nuclear arsenal. And um, it was sent from there in, uh, it was supposed to be ca very carefully monitored, and we were supposed to know everything that was in all of these barrels. It was a requirement by the state of New Mexico to allow the United States government to use these facilities to store nuclear waste. However, it uh, came to the attention through the report on the incident, the incident report, that uh, an error had been made in which kitty litter was used as an absorbent in these barrels, which also contain uh, true, what they call true waste or transuranic waste, which are items that are contaminated with um, elements that are beyond uh, uranium in the periodic table of the elements. And uh, they're mostly clothing, uh, tools, glove boxes, other detritus that was created by 75 years of nuclear weapons production that were contaminated with these elements. And um, enough to fill but depending on who you talk to, one or two Empire State Buildings, if they were empty. Uh, and that this, uh, this is then packed into barrels, and these barrels are then uh, sent to whipped for storage. However, uh, the, some of this waste is liquid or liquefied, and when they put the 
kitty litter in there to absorb the liquid, they were told to use inorganic kitty litter. Now, we're not a thousand percent sure what happened here, but it, it looks like there was a typographical error and putting inorganic, one word, kitty litter was misinterpreted as in organic kitty litter, two words. And so they went to a, my understanding, they went to a local outlet and purchased bags of uh, sweet brand organic kitty litter. They packaged it in the barrels. The barrels were then stored. And then they should have known that that, because they should know everything that's in these barrels, they should have known that this exact combination would create a chemical form of a plastic explosive that is the formula of which is already known so it should have popped up on their computers because they knew what they were putting in there if they had known what they were supposed to have known what they were putting into these barrels uh, so basically they in the process of packing the barrels created a radioactive plastic explosive and uh, one went off and caused an entire area as big as a football field to be contaminated and which was not supposed to happen endangering at least uh, 32 workers including, I think, a 10 or a dozen workers who were internally contaminated, very dangerous to actually absorb inside your body, plutonium, which is a potent carcinogen when you absorb it inside your body. And, um, and uh, there was uh, a fire, and now uh, th this plant is going to be closed for many years. And in your article, you re uh, refer to all of this as a cover-up of mounting problems encountered in modernizing the United States nuclear weapons arsenal. What did you mean by that? Well... Uh, the information has been very slow in coming and there's very little information. There has been an incident report, but uh, it was the state environmental secretary of New Mexico who was the one who told us that it was not one barrel that was potentially involved by 500 barrels that did not come directly to the public from the federal government, from the Department of Energy. Right. And uh, so are you going to continue your work uh, in this area, and can we come back to you to make sure that we cover uh, this well, story uh, in an ongoing way? Yes. Part of the story is that this waste, uh, uh, some of this waste I, I write about in the story, which is on who, what, why, uh, originated in a place called West Valley, New York, about 30 miles south of Buffalo, New York, where uh, a waste storage facility, 3,300-acre waste storage facility, was created by then-Governor Nelson Rockefeller in the 1960s to make the state of New York a leader in uh, nuclear uh, fuel reprocessing, of, uh, taking the waste from nuclear power plants and reprocessing it. Uh, that business collapsed, and New York became the proud owner of 600,000 gallons of high highly radioactive nuclear waste, which was supposed to be sent to the waste isolation pilot plant, but is now has uh, no future as far as being sent there, at least in the time for, for the foreseeable next few years, and is leaking its contents, has been exposed to be leaking its contents, radioactive contents, into the Great Lakes, and that there's a plume of strontium and other cesium and other uh, radioactive elements that are... Uh, uh, traveling underneath the ground towards uh, closer and closer towards the Great Lakes as we speak. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today, and we're going to be following this story. I hope you join us again. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on the Real News Network. On the Real News Network, right. And, you know, you need to uh, support the Real News Network if you can. They're one of the few sources of decent analysis around. And, uh, in fact, we're going to go to, to uh, them a little bit later in the show for another issue. But right now, I'm going to do something that'll, you know, YouTube will probably flash me a, a copyright violation for showing a little bit of John Stewart from the Comedy Central uh, copyright business or whatever you want to call it. They're going to try to violate my channel because of that. But this is a chance. This is different than any John Stewart comedy skit. John Stewart's usually trying to make jokes about things, you know, but because he's, as he says, he's a comedian first, and after that he just tries to get his message out or whatever. But the way things are going right now, the, our government is deliberately provoking race war. And it's so transparent. I mean, it's, it's absolutely obvious what they're doing. In the meantime, we have very stupid people both black and white, that are buying into that race crap. And they don't understand that you're just... Yes, race, racism is real. 
Racism is violent. Racism is deadly. Racism really exists, but it only exists in incredibly stupid people. And every once in a while, they're in a position of power, and that's really what makes somebody racist, because without that power, you're not a racist. You're a bigot. You're not a racist until you have the power to enforce your bigotry. Okay, so let's, we, we're misusing the words in the first place. But the point is, there are a lot of bigots out there. And bigotry is something that cannot be supported or validated with evidence. And anyway, so what it boils down to is they're purposely mining all the bad feelings we have for things that are going wrong in our lives. You know, all the economic pinches that are also being caused deliberately and causing great stress while you're stressed out and arguing and fighting with each other and now giving yourselves another battlefront, race, war. You're never going to talk about the elite and how they're systematically strip mining all the wealth they can find and leaving nothing left for the future generations, spreading poison uranium around everywhere as if it was something they had the right to even decide. Well, anyway... Okay, so we're going to listen to John Stewart and pay attention. This isn't funny. This is serious. Today, fortunately, by Malala Yousafzai, who is one of our favorites. Uh, she is a young woman who is uh, a Nobel uh, Peace Prize recipient, which I think is apropos for today. You know, uh, I, I have to. Uh, I have I have one job, and it's a pretty simple job. Uh, I come in in the morning, and we look at the news, and I write jokes about it, and then I make a couple of faces. And uh, like a, like a noise, like a, and uh, and then it's just cha-ching, and I'm out the door. Um, but I I didn't do my job today. I didn't, so I apologize. I got nothing for you in terms of like jokes and sounds, uh, because of of what happened in South Carolina. And maybe if I wasn't nearing the end of the run, or this wasn't such a common occurrence, maybe uh, I could have pulled out of the spiral. But I didn't. And so I honestly have, have nothing uh, other than just sadness, once again, that we have to peer into the abyss of the depraved violence that we do to each other and the nexus of a just gaping racial wound that will not heal, yet we pretend doesn't exist. And uh, I'm confident, though, that by acknowledging it, by staring into that and seeing it for what it is, we still won't do jack <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's us. <laughs> and that's the part that blows my mind. I don't want to get into the political argument of the guns and things, but what, what blows my mind is the disparity of response between when we think people that are foreign are going to kill us and us killing ourselves. If this had been what we thought was Islamic terrorism, it would fit into our, we, we invaded two countries and spent trillions of dollars and thousands of American lives and now fly uh, uh, unmanned death machines over like five or six different countries, all to keep Americans safe. It's got it. We've got to do whatever we can. We'll torture people. We've got to do whatever we can to keep Americans safe. Nine people shot in a church. What about that? Hey, what are you going to do? Crazy is as crazy is, right? That's the part that I cannot, for the life of me, wrap my head around. And you know it. You know that it's going to go down the same path. This is a terrible tragedy. They're already using... Uh, uh, the nuanced language of lack of effort for this. This is a terrorist attack. This is a, a violent attack on the Emanuel Church in South Carolina, which is a symbol uh, for the black community. It has stood uh, in that part of Charleston for a hundred and some years and has been attacked viciously many times, as many black churches have. And to pretend that, I, I heard someone on the news say, well, tragedy has visited this church. This, this wasn't a tornado. This was a racist. This was a guy with a Rhodesia badge on his sweater. And, you know, so the idea that we're, you know, I hate to even use this pun, but this one is black and white. It's, there's no nuance here.
This is... Uh, and, and we're going to keep pretending like... I don't get it. What happened? This one guy lost his mind. But this, we are steeped in that culture in this country, and we refuse to recognize it. And I cannot believe how hard people are working to discount it. Uh, in South Carolina, the roads that black people drive on are named for Confederate generals who fought to keep black people from being able to drive freely on that road. That's... That's insanity. That's racial wallpaper. That's, that's, you can't allow that. You know, nine people were shot in a black church by a white guy who hated them, who wanted to start some kind of civil war. The Confederate flag flies over South Carolina and the roads are named for Confederate generals. And the white guy's the one who feels like his country's being taken away from him. We're bringing it on ourselves. And that's the thing. Al-Qaeda, all those guys, ISIS, they're not <laughs> compared to the damage that we can apparently do to ourselves on a regular basis. So uh, our guest tonight is an incredible person who suffered uh, unspeakable violence uh, by extremists and her perseverance... Okay, that's basically the end of the clip. He didn't, they didn't include that interview. But that was the important part. You know, he gets serious. And, uh, you know, it, it brings to mind why do we have this problem in this country of, you know, extreme violence? And, and why do we feel like we have the right to completely conquer the world, you know, just based on we want it, you know, not based on anything good or decent? And I, I mentioned this before, you know, but one time I was talking to my dad, who was a political science teacher, and I asked him about World War II. He was a private in World War II. And anyway, he kind of summed it up saying, well, the Germans lost the war, but the Nazis won. And I, I didn't really understand fully what he meant, but, I, you know, gradually I I've, I've found out, you know, that at the end of the war, the police departments all over Europe were decimated and gone. You know, there was a, a, a real need to rebuild that. And, of course, we started building the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, I guess, which is the pre-runner for the CIA. And so how did we staff these organizations, especially across Europe? Why, Operation Paperclip, perhaps you've heard of that. That wasn't necessarily the only operation involved, but we harvested all the Nazis we could find that had any sort of either security training, whether they were SS or whether they were Gestapo, they were hired, and especially all the scientists. Now, the scientists we put to work, you know, <laughs> on our side building rockets and Dr. Werner von Braun, once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. A little Tom Lehrer there. But anyway, the point is, our entire country, right after the World War II, became Nazis. I mean, it's, it wasn't like they just started that way. But, th first of all, our businesses like IBM, and so IBM was created to keep track of the bodies and people in the concentration camps. Okay, so that's, so people don't, a little known history about IBM. And there were other big, big American businesses that, you know, flourished by selling things to Hitler. Throughout the entire war, they sold to both sides. And when people were being prosecuted for it, they got a free pass. Now, all across Europe, members of the Gestapo rebuilt European police departments. Now, anyway, that gives you some sort of idea why the, the so-called Western powers, which includes Europe and the United States, why are those Western powers so viciously fascist, and why are they so arrogantly warlike? Well, it's because we purposely rebuilt our nations with Nazis. 
The Germans lost the war. The Nazis won. And they're in our government to this day. I mean, it's obvious that the neocon is just another word for Nazi. Just like Zionist is another word for Nazi. You understand? Zionist has nothing to do with Jewish. And neocon has nothing to do with Christian. But they identify with those groups because you react to it. If you're going to react when somebody presses your Christian button, or you're going to react when somebody presses your Muslim button, or you're going to react when anybody presses any of your buttons, you're just not thinking things through. If you're going to get involved in a race war, you're, you're pretty stupid. It's like the people who go play video poker. They're really stupid. Because what are they doing? They're paying the rich man's taxes. The rich man says, I don't want to pay any taxes. Is there some way that we can put it off onto the poor people? Make the poor people pay my fair share? Yeah, let's do video poker. Their poor saps are going to be so starved for money that they, they're going to try anything they can. You know, easy money gamble. Put the thing in the machine and come back with $1,500. But that never happens, does it? Well, once in a rare while. That's the only thing you remember when you're gambling, right? You, only, you won $1,500. You forget about losing $200 a night for 40 weeks in a row or whatever. You know, God. So, okay, let's hear a history of big business and Hitler. Most Americans were against Hitler and against uh, Nazism in Germany, uh, were they? Well, that's certainly the impression we get from uh, watching Hollywood movies such as Saving Private Ryan or even Schindler's List or whatever. And uh, while there's no denying that many Americans uh, didn't like Hitler at all, in fact, uh, despised the man, and hated Nazism. And there's also, it's also true that many Americans actually liked Hitler and had nothing against Nazism and against fascism in general. In fact, they kind of liked Hitler and they liked fascism, they liked Nazism. And uh, one of the problems is that these people were actually, maybe not many in number, but they were very, very important people, very influential people. They were in many ways the, uh, the social, the economic, and in some ways political elite of the United States. And I'm thinking here in particular about the great captains of industry, as they say in the United States, the great industrialists, the bankers and leading lawyers of the United States, who in the 30s actually liked Hitler because, as the saying went, you could do business with Hitler. And that is indeed very, very important. To understand that, one must go back to the 1920s, to the years, the decade, after the First World War, when many American companies, for reasons which we can get into right now, made big investments in Germany, which was not yet under Nazi rule. Uh, for example, Ford and General Motors established big factories, big branch plants in Germany. And so did IBM and ITT and Gillette and Coca-Cola and Kodak and, you know, I could mention many, many other companies. And uh, they started to do business in, in Germany. And did they do very well? Well, the answer is no. Their business didn't go very well for quite some time because in the early 30s, on well, the late 20s already, the Great Depression broke out. And that was a major economic crisis, which was very bad, bad for business so all over the world. Business was bad in the United States and business was bad in Germany. But then, in 1933, in Germany, Hitler came to power. And suddenly, things started to improve for American investments in Germany. In fact, from the moment Hitler came to power in 1933, almost immediately uh, American investments in, the, uh, in Germany, American branch plants in Germany, started to make more and more money. And there was good reasons for that. One reason was that Hitler eliminated all trade unions, for example. And as a result of that, uh, companies in Germany, including foreign-owned companies, could start to pay less and less, you know, lower and lower wages to their workers and fewer benefits. And you could make them work longer hours without having to worry about the consequences because strikes were no longer allowed in Germany. So Hitler's type of fascism, Hitler's Nazism, was actually good for business in that sense, in that it's actually curtailed the power of unions and the political parties. Talk about which uh, the, the 
the Nazis through the communists in, uh, into concentration camps, and the Socialist Party no longer had any say whatsoever in the politics of the country. So in that respect, there was no problems either. So Hitler was good for business in that sense, but Hitler was even better for business in that because of Hitler, uh, business picked up in Germany in that Hitler ordered lots of goodies, lots of products from the American companies active in Germany. For example, he ordered lots of trucks and tanks and airplanes from companies like General Motors and Ford. And all kinds of equipment, for example, communications equipment from ITT uh, to enable airplanes to communicate with tanks. Hitler was preparing for war, as everybody now knows, and Hitler needed war material. He needed trucks, planes, and so forth. And these big American companies in Germany were very glad to provide that to Mr. Hitler. And contrary to what some people believe, that Hitler, for example, was a kind of communist who simply nationalized everything and didn't pay the bill, that's not true. Hitler did pay the bills. So Hitler business picked up in Germany big time. In fact, in Germany, big American corporations did better business than it did the United States itself. And you didn't have to have branch plants in Germany to do business with Hitler. You could also export to Germany directly. For example, the big American petroleum trusts like uh, Exxon, you know, well, then known as Standard Oil New Jersey, owned by the Rockefeller family, and Texaco supplied Hitler with all kinds of gas. Because Hitler was stockpiling gas. Obviously, if you want to wage a war involving Stuka airplanes and thousands of tanks rolling towards Warsaw or Paris or wherever, you need lots of gas. And I'll let you know, I'll have you know that in Germany, while there's lots of beer and I guess water, there's no gas. So uh, the gas you need to wage war, you have to import. And Hitler bought the gas from American sources, mostly. Not exclusively, mostly from American sources. So business with Hitler was very, very good business. Arming Hitler to the teeth was very good business. And when you would have asked an American captain of industry, such as Henry Ford, for example, in 1938, Mr. Ford, you're selling weapons to Hitler. You're selling trucks and tanks to Hitler. You know, don't you think Hitler is going to use that material to wage war against some country? The answer would have been, of course, it's going to be a war. But everybody who was in the know knew and expected that that war that Hitler for sure would unleash would be a war against the Soviet Union. And that was a great thing because most American industrialists and bankers and so on hated the Soviet Union a hell of a lot more than they hated Nazi Germany. Because in the Soviet Union, they were working on constructing a socialist society, a kind of counter system to the capitalist system for which the United States is famous, and which of course is the system that had produced the captains of industry, and from which the captains of industry of the United States were profiting. So actually, Hitler was a wonderful guy, wasn't he? Wasn't he? If you think about it. You made money thanks to Hitler. And Hitler, in the war we would have to unleash, you know, would actually end up destroying the Soviet Union, which was the one country in the whole world that you hated the most. So Hitler's plans for war was nothing that we had anything against. In fact, when the war broke out, in the United States, though that elite of industrialists and bankers were not unhappy at all. And when Hitler's tanks rolled into Poland and later on into Belgium and France, that was not a big deal to them at all. In fact, in June 1940, there was a big celebration in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where a German, the German consul invited all kinds of people to help celebrate the victories of the German army in the Low Countries against Poland and above all against France. And who was there? For example, Edsel Ford, the son of Henry Ford, and representatives of General Motors and ITT, who had helped him to win his victories. Because uh, Hitler's warfare was blitzkrieg warfare, lightning fast warfare, involving planes and tanks and trucks moving really fast. Well, most of the equipment, if you think about it, or well, much of it anyways, was supplied by American companies, either active in Germany via branch plants or supplying Germany directly, you know, via, for example, via fuel, petrol, or gas, oil, shipped in to Germany, either directly from the United States or via Mexico. So business with Hitler was wonderful business, and there was no reason whatsoever to dislike Hitler. In fact, if you would have said to Mr. Ford, uh, you're doing business with Hitler, and we understand that you're happy about that because you make lots of money in Germany, but don't you think Hitler is an awful anti-Semite and a racist, you know? Don't you dislike Hitler because of that? Well, the answer would have been no. 
because Mr. Ford himself was a notorious anti-Semite. And anti-Semitism was widespread in the high circles of society in the United States, and of course so was racism. So the fact that Hitler was an anti-Semite and was a racist was of no concern whatsoever. What he did to his Jews you know, was really no problem whatsoever for the big captains of industry in the United States. So war breaks out. And the war, at first, uh, produces all kinds of German victories. But then later on, uh, German victories sort of uh, end. The Britain doesn't give up. And the war is stalling. And it looks like it could last many more years. But that's no problem to the United States. Because in fact, the war itself is wonderful for business. Not only are we making money by selling equipment to the Germans, but since the British are holding out and need our products to continue to wage war, we now supply the British as well. And we can now supply all kinds of weapons and planes to the British who are fighting the Germans with our equipment as well. So actually, war is wonderful because we're supplying all enemies with weapons and make money in the process. And in the meantime, the United States itself is rearming, and we make money producing weapons there as well. And in fact, war, war is wonderful. You know? War means business like never before. In fact, it's fair to say that it's the war that pulled the United States out of the Great Depression, and not Mr. Roosevelt's New Deal, as some historians still like to think or pretend to believe. So war was wonderful. And the longer the war lasted, the better. In fact, there are some notorious statements by, by politicians and industrialists like Harry Truman and Henry Ford saying that this war, basically, the longer it lasts, the better for us. And at that stage, the United States had no desire whatsoever to intervene on behalf of the little democracies and against that big dictatorship of Hitler. But we all know that the United States would get involved in a war. But actually, the way they got involved in a war was, as one American historian, Stephen Ambrose, has put it, they sort of backed into the war. They sort of stumbled into the war. They did not choose to enter the war deliberately. They actually accidentally stepped into the war, so to speak. And it happened because the Japanese attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor, as everybody knows. Right? And we know that the next day, the United States declared war on Japan. Fair enough. And that would have led to a different war in the Pacific and in the Far East than the war being fought in Europe, which was between Great Britain and, in the meantime, the Soviet Union and Germany. There could have been have sort of two world wars. But the only reason why they merged to become one single world war is because four days after Pearl Harbor, Hitler declared war on the United States. It's wrong to think, as many people do, that Roosevelt, the United States, declared war on Germany after Pearl Harbor, because actually Germany had nothing to do with Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor, the United States declared war on Japan alone and not on Germany. Germany was not involved. And it's also wrong to, it's wrong to believe, as some historians do, that Germany had an obligation to come to the aid of the Japanese ally. And that is not true because Germany was only, you know, basically, it was only committed to help Japan if Japan was attacked by a third country. But that was not the case at Pearl Harbor. Japan attacked a third country. It was not attacked by a third country. So Germany had no obligation whatsoever to come to the aid of Japan. But Hitler did. Four days after Pearl Harbor, on the 11th of December, he declared war on the United States. Which raises the question, if Hitler wouldn't declare war, wouldn't have declared war on the United States, when would the United States have declared war on Germany? You know, possibly never at all. You know, possibly would have ever come to the aid of the little democracies and the oppressed countries and occupied countries of Europe. But they did, and that raises a question why Hitler did declare war on the United States on December, uh, December the 11th, 1941. And the answer actually is to be found by looking at the situation of the German army in Russia at that time. In June 1941, Germany had attacked the Soviet Union. And they confidently believed at that time in Berlin that the war in the Soviet Union would last six to eight weeks. Within two months, it would be over. And it was very important for Germany that that be the case. Because at that, case, at that stage, Germany only had about fuel left to wage war for about another four months. So within four months, they had to defeat the Soviet Union in order to lay their hands on the oil-rich regions of the Caucasus. And if they would have done so, Germany would have been able to, car to carry on the war forever against any major power in the world. Because the big weakness of Germany was the lack of raw materials, especially the lack of oil. Right? So the war against the Soviet Union for Hitler was very important in many ways. 
It was important because Hitler's big dream, his mission in life, was the destruction of the Soviet Union, the, the, the cradle of the revolution, the cradle of communism. But also, gra grabbing the Soviet Union would have meant giving Germany a major industrial power, plenty of raw materials it needed, the rich farmlands of the Ukraine, for example, you know, and the oil fields of the Caucasus. These were the big prizes to be won in Russia. So Germany had to win fast because oil supplies had been dwindling already in 1940 in early 1941. So the war at first went well, but by August, September, October, it became clear that Germany did not have an easy time in the Soviet Union, that the resistance of the Soviets was much tougher than expected. And the catastrophe happened for Germans on the 5th of December 1941 which is when the Red Army counterattacked in front of Moscow and actually gave Hitler's armed forces a big bloody nose. And that same day, the generals reported to Hitler in Berlin that he had to lose the war, that we were going to lose the war because we're now stuck in the Soviet Union in the middle of the winter. You know, we're on the defensive now. We have no hope in hell of winning anymore this year. And we're out of fuel. You know, even trying again next year is going to be very, very difficult. There's no more element of surprise, you know, and the Soviets are still very, very strong. And that's the reason, I think, that's the reason why many historians think that Hitler declared war on the United States on December 11, 1941. He was actually, he was desperate, desperately looking for a solution. He thought that by declaring war without having to do so against the enemy of his Japanese friends, that he might somehow cause the Japanese to reciprocate by declaring war on his enemy, the Russians. And that would have meant that the Japanese army, which was in China at the time, would have asked, asked, attacked the Soviets in the area of Vladivostok and forced the Soviet Union on a two-front war. And then, maybe, just maybe, you know, Germany might still have had a chance to win the war against the Soviet Union. But that gamble didn't pay off, because we all know that Japan said thank you very much to Hitler for attacking, for declaring war in the United States. But Japan did not reciprocate with a declaration of war against the Soviet Union. And as a result of that, Hitler had to carry on alone against his war, in his war against the Soviet Union, a war he was end up losing. And in fact, in fact, it's fair to say that it is the Soviet Union that defeated Nazi Germany, with the help, obviously, of the Americans, the British, the Canadians, you know. It took, it took contributions from all the Allies to defeat Nazi Germany, which was a very, very powerful and militarily mighty country. Uh, but a major contribution was undoubtedly made by the Soviet Union. But to come back for a moment to the American uh, corporate connection, you might say, with Nazi Germany. You know, after Pearl Harbor then, or at least four days after Pearl Harbor, and the United States is officially at war with Nazi Germany. So what happened to the American investments, to the American branch plants in Germany? Well, the answer is business as usual. They kept on producing for Hitler. They kept on producing weapons until the very end. And Hitler kept paying the bills until the very end. And actually, business continued to be very good. You know, Ford, General Motors, IBM, ITT, continued to make big profits in Nazi Germany even after Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Uh, officially, the headquarters in the United States lost control over operation in Germany. But that is actually only partly true. I give details about that in my book on the myth of the good war. But the reality is that actually business continued and these American corporations continued to do very, very well. Thank you very much until the very, very end of the war. And uh, it's very likely, it's almost certainly not a coincidence, that while our bombers, the American and British bombers, bombed have a lot of German cities like Cologne and Hamburg and Dresden, and destroyed old buildings galore and churches and cathedrals that actually they hardly ever bombed the big factories of American branch plants in Germany, such as the big Ford factory, for example, on the banks of the Rhine in Germany, such as the plant of, uh, of General Motors in Rüsselsheim. So at the end of the war, it's fair to say that actually Americans saved their investments in Germany and came out you know, with big, big investments still intact in Germany. And um, these companies, these businesses are still there today, still making very much money. Thank you very much. But the more of the story is that the United States did not fight the war against Germany because they hated Nazism, they hated Hitler. 
uh, they fought the war, basically. Uh, first, they didn't want to fight against Hitler at all, because they made lots of money thanks to Hitler. And later on, they made lots of money out of a war, fighting or providing both Hitler and his enemies you know, with equipment. So the war was a wonderful thing. And that's one of the lessons, a thing that we have to consider for the post-war period. Um, the, the United States never had anything against Nazism and fascism. And today we see how in Ukraine, for example, the United States tolerate and even encourage and even support neo-Nazi elements, you know, as they wage a struggle now against the Russians over there. And there seems to be nothing wrong with that as far as the Americans are concerned. Nazis are not a problem as far as we are concerned, uh, seemingly, regrettably. You know. And uh, secondly, war is still very good for business. So when the war ended, actually, many American economists were concerned that war would be the end of the good times. War would be the end of the boom, the wartime boom. And as a result of that, when the war ended, we had to find new wars. And that's why the Cold War was so wonderful, because the Cold War allowed the system to keep on functioning. The warfare system, as it's called, the Pentagon system, to keep, to keep working. That's the one where, of which Eisenhower later said, famously said that it's the military-industrial complex that's profiting from all that. Well, indeed, he was right. You know, the Cold War picked up the slack of the Second World War. And after the Cold War, the Gulf War. And after the Gulf War, the ultimate solution you know, war against terrorism, which means worldwide war, you know, permanent war. And that's the great solution, so to speak, because as many people know, if peace would break out, it would be a catastrophe for the American economy. Yeah, it, it, it pains me to think that all my life, while they've been teaching us that America stands for truth, justice and the, you know, <laughs> just just the American way, but the American way was supposed to be peace and happiness and families and good values and things like that. And it turns out that every bit of that was a lie. Of course, we, the people, it, to us, it isn't a lie. I mean, it really is true for the people. We are decent insofar as we think about it, we are. But they've developed all kinds of new techniques to trick you into, uh, well, for instance, thinking that Muslims attacked us on 9-11. And they didn't. But we have built an entire world on anti-Muslim hate. Deliberately did that. You know, that America is responsible for that. We did that on purpose to an innocent group of people. The Muslims were innocent. The only people that were guilty are still in our government. Well, this corruption thing, they found out that they had to keep a war going. They had to always be fighting. Now, we, this is not anything new. If you go back in history, you'll find out, and, and we passed this around during the Vietnam War an awful lot, this, this information was that the United States never had a period of peace. Ever since we were founded, we've had our military in somebody else's business killing somebody else's people to steal somebody else's property. Every single year since the beginning of the United States. So we have never been a country that believed in peace and honoring your neighbor and things like that. That's only what you and I were taught. They lied to us. And it's beginning to be so obvious. Now, we get to this Iraq war. And it was obvious from the very beginning that all they were doing is dividing it up for the corporations. They even had maps drawn ahead of time with the corporation that was going to own this section or that section. I should have probably brought that out. I mean, it's not hard to find. But anyway, it's, it's amazing. So then they came up with the idea of privatizing the military. It doesn't matter as long as we have to keep arming people. We arm the private people. We arm the military of other countries. We arm the military of our country. Money, money, money. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. That's the only thing that drives it. And it's not just a saying. It's really the fact. They privatized the military and it wind up uh, th there's a reason for doing that, too, really. I mean, another separate reason, and that is that now these privatized military 
that are following our orders can do all kinds of atrocities, but it's not in our name anymore, see? It's not the U.S. military doing that. It's those private contractors, those out-of-control rogue private contractors. But I guarantee you, you know, the, the government is powerful enough to, to pull their ticket if they wanted to. You know, the, it, like we said, it's about money. And those folks doing those atrocities will stop doing it if they get paid to stop. But right now they're getting paid to not stop. Um, but we were just talking about waste and, and corruption. And that's what they need to design into things. Like we had communism that we were fighting, right? Well, that was an easy one because there wasn't really any battle. And then we had the drug war, and that was an easy one because there wasn't really any battle because we ran both sides. We, we, we grew, processed, transferred, and sold the drugs. Our government did, usually the CIA. And then we fought the drug war. And, of course, the people who got arrested were the freelancers that were trying to cash in on the same thing, but they weren't sanctioned by the government. Well... I'm going to play this. It's really a trailer for a new movie by Brave New Films. Look it up, Brave New Films. They make all kinds of good stuff. That I played stuff from them before. And their new movie is called A Rock for Sale, and we're going to go out with this one. So I'll see you next Saturday. The contracting business in Iraq is very, very lucrative. There was so much money being given away over there to contractors. I mean, there were, there were jobs that didn't even need to be there. Uh, you know, we'd go into the tent to use our, our internet, and the woman who would put my name down to assign me to a computer would be a civilian contractor who was making six figures to be over there. But why is she there? Why are we paying this woman to do this? They threw so much money at these people they can't refuse. I mean, if you're a mechanic, you're making like twenty or thirty thousand. Someone offers you a hundred thousand a year, tax-free, to go to Iraq, and that's that's hard. I think that's really hard to refuse. They would very often sit down with soldiers, particularly from Reserve or National Guard, and say, "Hey, man, you know, what are you making? Three thousand dollars a month over here? You know, I make that in a week." You would talk about how you know, in in eight more months, I'm going to be out of here, and I'm going to be making a hundred and forty grand. It certainly affected retention. Because I don't know, I don't know why any any military person would re-enlist to do the same job when they could get out of the military and make you know six times their money and uh, and do the same job. There was a uh, um, a little uh, phrase that we threw around, um, food for freedom, that if if you wanted to get paid more, you should start eating more, so that you'd get booted out for being overweight. And um, it's an honorable discharge, and it would it would boost your uh, your pay, you know, your net worth by about five times, um, if you were to do such a thing, and um, and it worked. Uh, وأخذوني أنا وابني فابني ده يقول لهم يقول لهم هذه أمي فإجا الأمريكي جرني من إيدي حق قال لي جو سكو يتشي حي صح فقال لي اعترفي إذا ما تعترفين على الإرهابين وياك حوديك مكان يعتدون عليك ويلعبون بيش طوب الأمريكا فأحسن لك أحجي أنت وابنك I was getting really angry, I mean, especially because I knew that a lot of these prisoners that I saw uh, with these injuries from, from abuse and torture really hadn't done anything. They weren't part of the insurgency. They were just picked up for no reason at all. We were interrogating taxi drivers and, you know, like, pizza delivery guys. Um, it was just, you know, we called them average Ahmed. Using methods such as torture, and also using people who are not qualified to do this job has resulted in bad information and therefore uh, problems for national security and for the soldiers because you're, you're getting information that's no good. In a lot of areas where you start noticing a lot of, you know, a lot of hostility against American soldiers, it's not because the soldiers are doing a lot of wrong things. It's because sometimes maybe the communication that has been transmitted to them has been transmitted to them wrongly and professionally 
as serving someone else's interest. These are Titan linguists. They were hired by Titan. <laughs> Titan has long-standing contracts providing critical information technology and support services for some of our nation's most valuable defense assets. Under a contract with the U.S. Army's Intelligence and Security Command, Titan has over 4,000 linguists that provide invaluable mission-critical services. Titan is the company that provides the linguists and continues to provide the linguists throughout Iraq. They're the biggest provider in this business. They were so desperate to get people to fill these positions as translators that they were just hiring anybody that uh, approached somebody and obviously had command of the English language in addition to the Arabic language or Farsi or whatever it may have been. There was people who maybe spoke the language, but it was broken, but could not read it or write it. And I'm talking about English here. And they were hired. They were never given a test. Nobody was given a test. I was never given a test. The test I was given was a phone conversation for a minute. Military trusted us. Military trusted Titan. Titan came and said, here's a linguist that we have hired, we have trained, tested, we put our trust in, he passed his security clearance, or he got some kind of a clearance. You should trust him in everything he does, everything he say. I did work closely with Titan all year long while I was in Iraq. Uh, and I can say that a lot of the, the translators weren't trained at all. I don't, I don't know what kind of training they received, but they were, they were terrible at it. There was no managers, there was no supervision, there was no training, there was no follow-up. There was whatsoever a system of evaluation of what linguists are doing or how, what they're doing. Even a system of if these linguists really translating or doing or really are they translating or giving their opinions. Titan made the big bucks and hired the most incompetent people most of the time, did not follow up with them, did not really know what they were doing. Probably as a result, a lot of people got hurt, a lot of people got killed, American lives got lost because someone wants to make money and wants to have a fat check in his pocket.